okay fundamentals first because we have seen a lot of things but what is the math or the, the physics behind that i think we all need, we all studied that long time ago some of you fresh some of you long time ago so let me just refresh everybody's memory about the fundamentals a little bit so historical perspective let's go really back to this guy galileo galilei 1600s because he can be considered as the first person who started thinking about physics and structures and started thinking about inertia and things like that but he didn't really come up with any theories or formulas or anything but his thinking was very instrumental in starting many discussions later but the people that we the person that we know most is probably this guy robert hooke we have all familiar with hooke's law and most people miss assign hooke's law or the equation the, the linear equ uh, spring equation to him he actually never developed that equation he only made this statement uh in latin it's it probably reads something like utensio sequis as the extension so the force so the force and extension are proportional but he never figured out what is the proportionality constant he just figured this out and just said and that was a big thing enough this is 1660 and then came the second gentleman newton and we all know what he did so he gave us many laws the most important of them is f is equal to ma maybe about 80 years 90 years after them and this is the first real equation you can find that you can use that is still being used and this was instrumental in and i will show you what's the difference between the two in a minute and the third one fourth one is important thomas young who gave us the young's modulus in fact he is the one who actually made the stress the force and extension relation complete by adding the constant e so uh, before that it took 200 years between him and hook for this equation simple equation to be developed and this equation that we all know so much f is equal to f is equal to ku or force is, is equal to spring constant multiplied by displacement but actually never developed until late 1800s or 1800s so it took him almost 200 years before his idea hooks idea was converted into the proper equation then the concept of stiffness did not exist because only after young the stiffness was understood because stiffness as you know is ei or something so e did not exist so when e came in then we have the start of the whole math or the mechanics in engineering okay having said that let's go back now one more time newton so newton said as you know f is equal to ma so he dealt with a body which was freely moving like a car with no deformation so motion was evident it was not stationary so that was the force required to accelerate a body as we all know so he is talking about a rigid body in motion and on the other hand structural engineers or engineers have a rigid have a body with no mass attached to the ground and it is not moving it's just displacing by the force f the displacement u but both of them are talking about displacement one motion one fixed to the ground so two completely different things if you when you combine them together so this is now based for engineers that's for physics if you combine them together you get the equation combine equation of mass plus plus force due to mass plus force due to stiffness and then you get the total so you have a mass now you have a stiffness now and you have a displacement and so you have this relationship by combining newton and hook so to speak together and then but still it is missing because it is representing the support by a by a stick which has no material it's just a stiffness but it has no material real dimensions but in reality you have dimensions of a material of a column so that means it is a material so when it will deform due to that de de deformation 
it will resist that internally and damping will come in. Energy will be, will be stored there and then damping will come in. So we have now damping coming in from the material which is deforming and plus the stiffness plus the mass. So now we have the complete equation of uh, equilibrium for dynamic motion. But the thing is, it's still linear. Everything is linear because the, the, the mass, of course, is unchanging. Stiffness is unchanging and K is also unchanging. So relationship is still linear. But people started doing testing at that time and they observed that this is not true. And they found that before that, ground acceleration also came in. So now we have an equation that, okay, we have an earthquake, then we, instead of that side, we replace the FT by the ground acceleration. Now we have one side is the internal force and one side the external force, external force coming from the ground acceleration plus the mass. And that became the standard equation for seismic or ground motion analysis. But still everything is linear. There is no nonlinearity in this entire formulation. But so Hooke's law states that we have this relationship, but observation states that we have this relationship, this testing. So that means there is a clear difference between the linear and the nonlinear at this point. So there's a nonlinear force connecting to the nonlinear response, and there's an elastic force connected to the elastic response, and that difference is delta F. So that's a reduction or change of the force from linear to nonlinear. So when this was observed, then that equation had to be modified to get from the linear to the nonlinear. And we went back and they added equation F is equal to KU plus delta F plus or minus, depending on the sign. So which means the nonlinearity is now part of the equation by simply making this small correction. So it looks very simple. Oh, it's so easy. We can just correct that. But the problem is in, in computation, the blue line is never known. We only know the black line. In test, the blue line is known. So you can easily de determine the difference. But when you're doing the computation in math or analysis, we don't know where the nonlinear response is. So which means that the delta F cannot be found in that equation. That has to be done iteratively. And, it's, it be, and if it is dynamic, very, very iteratively because everything is changing. And that is the problem that suddenly make that equation extremely complicated. So we go back there and we add that nonlinearity to the linear system here, to, to the static system here. So we can non, static nonlinear. And then we add it back, combine it with the dynamics and add nonlinearity. So we have the full nonlinear dynamic, non dynamic equation and we add ground motion. So we have the complete ground motion equation. So from Hooke and Newton all the way to full nonlinear dynamic equation took several years, several maths, with several people who worked on it, several testing until we arrived at that. So which means that now we have the, as they say, holy grail. We have the equation that can solve everything because that equation has nonlinearity, has dynamics, has damping, has stiffness, has everything a system can have. Nothing is missing. So which means that's great because now have mathematically a very clean, nice solution available to us. This has been available to us for a number of years, but it could not be used because we couldn't solve this equation effectively because of the, like I said, uh, the nonlinearity and all the dynamics, both of them, uh, the solution is very, very hard, except un unless it's a single degree of freedom, even that is very hard. For millions of degrees of freedom, it's impossible. So that's why even we had the equation, we didn't have the solution. So this is the equation available. So what, what engineers start to do is, how can we simplify this equation? Because we can't solve it, what can we do to get the same effect as this one? The first was that, okay, let's remove everything, only mass and stiffness equal to zero, and we can do the natural response. So that was the first thing, eigenvalue problem. Can, math, math is there, so you can solve the eigenvalue to find more shapes and initial period. 
So that was the first thing that remove everything from the equation, ignore everything, just keep mass and stiffness, which is the body itself to find the natural response. So that was great because this does not depend on damping, does not depend on damage, does not depend on the uh, external force, just natural property. So that was one. Second was this one, equivalent static. This was a great idea because like uh, Dr. Mack mentioned in the morning, equivalent static method has gone through a lot of changes. But look at the simplicity of the equation. MUG is weight, W of the structure. And alpha is a correction factor which incorporates damping, stiffness, nonlinearity, and ground motion into one factor. So this factor has progressed. Those of you who are as old as I am, there was an equation called in 19, I think 77 code, V is equal to Z, K, I, W, something, something. And each factor in that equation was trying to create a simplification of these other complications and convert that into a combined factor. The R factor, the importance factor, the seismic zone factor, all those factors belong to alpha. So they are correction, they're kind of a cumulative simplification of this equation so we can get the weight multiplied by a factor and get the force applied to the structure. W by 10, when I, I, was, I started design, it was common to use W by 10 as the equivalent force. Nothing, no complication. One minute you have the seismic force attached to the, applied to the structure. Then response spectrum came out as a simplification by converting that into uh, uh, from the frequency domain, time domain to frequency domain, getting the maximum response. So response spectrum method was born and that became and still is a very good method because it gives you the maximum from this, that, that equation by converting that into a simplified version of the response. And then pushover came, came over which is the same, removing the dynamics, removing the damping, just keep the nonlinearity and keep that and you get the pushover. So pushover became another important method which is still being used because it gives you, it captures the nonlinearity, doesn't capture the dynamics, but captures the nonlinearity. So we can isolate the, the, the dynamics here. This captures the dynamics. This captures the, non, the nonlinearity into two separate methods and then we can somehow combine them together. So you get that, those methods. And then you get the linear time history, which was kind of remove the nonlinearity, just solve the linear time history, which is still very useful uh, to capture the dynamics, but non, non, not the nonlinearity. So no nonlinearity, dynamics, no dynamics, nonlinearity, no dynamics, no nonlinearity, kind of dynamics, nothing equivalent static and so on. And then you have the nonlinear time history, Linear time history, modal, equivalent static, pushover, response spectrum, all methods derived from the same equation. They are just the simplification of the main basic equation that we developed just because we didn't have the power or the time or the data to solve them, to solve this one. So you have natural response, simplify it with factors, ignore inertia, ignore nonlinearity, maximum linear response, all coming from the same equation. But now the situation has changed. Last 10 years, 5 years, 10 years, computer programs, computers as you know, capability has increased so, so much. So the ability to solve this full nonlinear time history is not there. It's not a mystery anymore. Many programs can solve it well as long as we provide the right data. But because the data required is, is significant, we have difficulty using it in practice. Let's go back to a bridge now and see where these things are, where these things can come from, or where these things can be, where they're, they're, they're stored. Mass. Most of the mass in a bridge is on the superstructure. So you can say, okay, mass is over there. Primarily, 80, 90, depending upon the type, will be there. So the mass is, if you want to reduce the, the seismic response, the first thing is that you reduce mass. Steel bridge, for example, will reduce the mass immediately. Or you find a way to economize on the mass because that's a direct contributor to this one. So please remember, before we go on, 
The left hand side is the force generated by the structure. And this is the base shear kind of a thing on this side. And on left hand side, the mass is multiplied by the acceleration of the mass, not acceleration of the ground. So which means that if you can to reduce this effect, we can reduce the mass or we can reduce the acceleration in that mass. And that's where this isolation system comes in. But so we are trying to reduce this force because of the mass. So we reduce the mass or we reduce the acceleration. We don't let it move. So if there's no acceleration, there's no force. And then same is the case with damping and stiffness and those. So we come back one by one. So mass and acceleration in that mass can be controlled to reduce these total base shear generated in the bridge. Second one is stiffness. So stiffness is contributed primarily by the substructure. So we have stiffness coming from the foundation system, from the abutment system, from the bent systems in both direction. And stiffness is both linear part and nonlinear part. And so right now, let's say, if you want to control the stiffness, then you need to control these stiffness of these components, including soil, including the ground. So the total system, foundation system, bent system, abutment system, very complicated. They control the stiffness, the K part over there. And then damping contributors. So damping contributors, again, come from the soil, from the, from the abutment, especially a lot component from there, foundations and soil and ground, the damping coming from the yielding of the components, uh, hinges coming from the bearings, coming from the isolators, coming from the, the devices that we attach. So we have the damping devices or damping natural or modal or damage or whatever or viscous. So many types of damping comes into play in the bridge and we can use each type of damping to increase or decrease this part as we need it. So damping comes from devices and the design and the nonlinearity combined together. And damping is also nonlinear. It's a non not a linear property. It varies with displacement and velocity when that changes. Then we come to sources of damping, natural dam material damping, friction damping, energy dissipation in foundation, cracking and yielding, aerodynamic damping, damping from non-structural elements, and intentional damping devices that we talked about a lot since morning. So damping can be coming from all these sources. So if you want to manage that, you can manipulate these dampings in various ways. Nonlinearity, that is the difficult part because nonlinearity comes from many sources, both controlled and uncontrolled. And once again, the most complex nonlinearity may come from abutment areas. And we have seen the, the isolators also as part of the nonlinearity. And then bearings, then shear keys, then the restrainers. They have the gap element, they have the joint. So the nonlinearity in bridges is very complex compared to buildings because things are not connected. Unlike buildings where the things are connected, so it's just a moment, a moment thing. So you can have nonlinearity in moment in column or in beams. But here we have gaps. We have gap between the, the diaphragm and the shear key. You have the gap between the diaphragm and the strainer. You have a gap between the girder and the abutment. And you have the, the, the bearings which have their own nonlinearities. And then you have yielding of the, the, the piles or the yielding of the caps and so on. So nonlinearity in a bridge is pretty, pretty complicated. And then you have, on top of that, you have geometric nonlinearities, you have the P delta effects, you have all of that large, large displacements, nonlinearity. So, so many nonlinearities are present almost everywhere. And these are the most difficult properties to model accurately. And that's why solving this equation becomes hard because we can't really model all the nonlinearities properly. So if the nonlinearity is not modeled properly, the response prediction cannot be reliable. So the stiffness nonlinearity has many components because stiffness is gradually built up from the material stiffness, E, to section stiffness, EI, to member stiffness, rotation, and structure stiffness, delta. So if you look at that stiffness built up, each one of them is nonlinear. This material stress strain curve is nonlinear. Steel stress stress strain curve is nonlinear. So at the beginning, the material are nonlinear. So no matter what you do, the structure is going to be nonlinear because you made them from nonlinear materials. Section itself changes, cra cracks, damages when we deform. So we have moment curvature or moment rotation, which is also nonlinear. And then you have 
the member, which is the moment of deflection or moment of rotation multiplied by the hinge. So the hinge hinges come in, hinge length from curvature calculated, adopted here. And then you have the structure, nonlinearity, force, and deformation of the total displacement of the building or the bridge. So you can see from here that the nonlinearity is built up step by step from the materials to sections to members to structure and all the way with all the devices and so many things. So that's why nonlinearity, handling nonlinearity reliably is a problem. Not only in defining, but the programs have a difficulty in finding the solution to nonlinearity. And sometimes they cannot find it. And you have all those of you who run nonlinear analysis know that many times the program just stops for no reason. You can't get the pushover curve. You can't get the answer. The program ran for many. In our case, we were doing the, the terminal one, and we were doing the nonlinear response when we were going to retrofit it using BRBs. So there were 250 BRBs. And we ran that model for 20 days to get the nonlinear response. And it wouldn't run and complete because many years ago, computers were not that fast. But the convergence is a problem. Numerical convergence is a problem. So that's why nonlinear, even if you have the data, we may not get the right response. So material non geometric nonlinearities, behavior nonlinearities, bearing nonlinear abutment, backfill interaction. In fact, we can spend the whole day talking about nonlinearity of the abutment and the backfill interaction. Foundation piles nonlinearity, boundary conditions, damping, and so on. So nonlinearity is, is one of the difficult things. That's why, what, what, you know, since morning we have been talking about uh, using isolators because you want to put all the nonlinearity into one device and be done with it and keep everything else linear. That's a good approach because then you don't need to worry about other things. You put everything into one device. Ground motion, and this is the hard part. When Rosa mentioned, for real input of the ground motion, you can't rely on the code maps because they don't have the specific information about the site. So you have got to do a PSHA, the uh, probabilistic site, site hazard analysis, because you need to get the actual ground motion at the site based on the soil, based on the attenuation model, based on the bedrock location, based on everything. And then you get that, and then you apply that ground motion. So that, that has to be reliable. And it, you have to do multiple, 31 time histories, 11 time histories, 14 time histories, depending on the code, because you need to average. You need to make sure that you don't miss type of ground motion, near fault, far fault, uh, you know, all kinds of abduction zone. All those kinds of things have to be considered in creating these ground motion uh, records that you apply. And that is the second difficult part. Nonlinearity is the one, first one, and capturing or providing proper ground motion input is the second one. And these are really difficult because data is not always easily available. So coming back, if you want to use this equation, you have to see what data you have, what tools you have, what resources you have. As a consultant, how much are you getting paid to do the project? because it really takes a lot of time to do nonlinear time history analysis. It's just somebody's shaking their head. They have done it. They know how hard it is. So it's really a lot, you know, like an order of 100 more than normal standard design, like response spectrum design. So there's no comparison. So that's why we need to choose the method. And many times, we choose many of them. You can't rely on one. Even if you do nonlinear time history, you still need to do pushover. You should do pushover. You should do linear time history. You should do static. So you can compare them to make sure that you got the results which are reliable. They are relatable because you can't have illogical results coming out from the analysis. And nonlinear analysis can produce illogical results sometimes. So you need to do all of that. And response spectrum, any case is required. So most of the time, I would say you need most of them anyway. The model analysis is needed for most others, so almost all of them may need to be run. <laughs>